Hi, welcome to Virginia Time Travel, your portal of the Commonwealth's past, present, and future. Many books and movies have been set in our area. People are fascinated by the nation's capital. Our guest today, author Matthew Iden, in addition to writing science fiction, fantasy, and literary fiction with a psychological twist, also writes crime thrillers, hard-boiled crime thrillers set right here in Washington, D.C. and Northern Virginia. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> you have a very interesting background, as would befit a, a writer. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I, um, I have an ed educational background in English literature, uh, graduate degrees in English literature, and I knew I always wanted to write. Uh, like a lot of would-be authors and writers, I started young, but um, I didn't really get serious till about 10 or 12 years ago with a real eye towards professional uh, publication. Um, and so I began, I think, learning how to write, learning how to, I thought I knew how to write, but it took um, a lot of work and several, as they say, drawer novels, uh, books you write and never will see the light of day. Uh, before I felt like I was, uh, I had the confidence and a little bit of expertise to actually go ahead and uh, publish my books. So I've been self-publishing. I'm an independent, independently, or indie author, I guess you would say. I've been independently publishing my short stories and my novels for about two or two and a half years, and I love it. Uh, I'm having a great time. I meet a lot of great people through my writing, and um, right now, as you say, I, I'm a, mostly involved in my crime fiction writing. I have uh, three books soon to be four out in the Marty Singer Detective Series, all based here in Northern Virginia and uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, that's pretty much where I've, I've staked my reputation. So um, I'm having a great time. I had some interesting <coughs> life experiences. Um, I know you worked up in Alaska for a while. That's right. Has that influenced your writing or, <laughs> I mean, directly, or is it just all part of the... Well, I shot my first gun in Alaska. Um, okay. <laughs> so that, that gave me a little bit of uh, experience in that realm. But uh, I think it's important, uh, you know, they say write what you know. Um, I don't think you have to... Uh, shoot anybody to write about crime fiction, but I think you need to have kind of a breadth of experience. You can't just sit at home. Uh, meeting people, knowing how people work, how to observe people and, and situations, uh, those are important things when you write about any subject in any genre. Uh, even if you wrote science fiction and fantasy, you better know what people think and how they feel inside their, their heart when they do something. So, um, yeah, I've traveled extensively. I've had a, kind of a crazy work experience. And that's simply helped me when it comes down to talking about people. Well, it's interesting when you talk about <clears throat> how you develop your characters. So your characters are taken from real life. Mm -hmm. I'm reading a book now. It's a, it's a very popular book. But I mean, frankly, a lot of the characters are just like stock characters that yeah. you would see on a sitcom or something. And it's just like, you know, yeah. it's just they fit the suit. And it's just not very satisfying to me anyway. So Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we call them cutouts. For a reason, they're two-dimensional, often flat characters. That's a that's a figured and a literal description, really. Um, so yeah, I think you need to know people if you're going to write about people, and that that runs the gamut from cops to villains to uh, just the the average Joe on the street that you want to put into your into your book. I think it was Ian e. Forster said, "A good character will surprise you," and um, flat characters don't do that. And you're going to write flat characters if you don't get out there and meet people and uh, and talk to them. All right. Now. Um where do you get your ideas? I mean, you write across a broad spectrum. I mean, mm -hmm. science fiction, fantasy, mm -hmm. you know, hard-boiled crime. I mean, mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, most of my ideas and uh, most of the uh, concepts I have for characters have their beginnings in somebody I've met or something I've read. Um, Blue Blood, which is uh, the second book that I wrote, uh, is really derived, uh, or was derived, inspired by uh, gang activity that we have problems with in this area, um, especially MS-13 and some gangs that people are aware of. Um, and uh, so I, I lifted a couple of episodes from a fairly famous case uh, here in the area that happened about three years ago. And that was the starting point. You certainly, you know, I'm not, in, I'm not writing journalism, I'm writing fiction, so you have to dramatize some events and frankly tone other events, events down. Uh, but a lot of my work comes out of, is born out of uh, actual events and actual people. Now, of course, you know, Patricia Cornwell 
you know, down in Richmond. I mean, she attached herself to the coroner's office, and she really, really got into it. Yeah. Now, do you have to do it at that level in order to write realistic fiction, or what do you think? I, I don't think so, although, you know, research is a, an extremely important component, especially I, uh, I didn't set out to write what they call police procedurals. Uh, they get, they're given that name because they're meant to be extremely accurate in their portrayal. Um, I know my limitations. I'm not a, a law enforcement officer. I never pretend to be one. I have very good friends in law enforcement who steer me and chide me when I do the wrong thing. But um, I try to be as accurate as I can without getting in, lost in the weeds, so to speak. Mm -hmm. A little bit of accuracy and research goes a long way. Uh, and if you research a lot and just use a few pertinent details, um, that's enough, I think, to gain, gain the trust of the reader um, and not, not attempt to pull the wool over their eyes, to actually tell a story while being uh, truthful to the material. Now, <clears throat> kind of doing my due diligence on you, I see that you were influenced by Mickey Spillane. Um, so why hard-boiled? Was it just the Mickey Spillane, or what drew you to that? particular genre of, uh, maybe you ought to outline the different genres of, uh, of mystery and, and crime. Sure. Um, well, there are many subgenres that you might file under mystery or under crime fiction. Um, I prefer, I enjoy reading what's a, a new trend in thriller and crime fiction, which is kind of the indestructible hero, the hero that cannot be beaten in a fight or in a shootout or can do no wrong and, um, you know, maybe they have one small weakness, but uh, you know, you know they're going to save the day. Well, I, I enjoy reading those kinds of books, but I don't necessarily uh, find myself able to write them. Uh, I think it's like Harry Bosch, or exactly, exactly. Uh -huh. Michael Connelly's books, uh, to a lesser extent, Robert B. Parker's Spencer series. Those, to me, those were oh, that guy's pretty tough. Uh, he rarely loses a fight. But um, when you see a little bit of a flaw, when you or or just a weakness, I think you can uh, communicate with that character. You'll you'll have a rapport with that character, and this gets back to knowing about people and understanding people. I haven't met Superman yet on the street, and so I'm not going to write very well about him, but I've met plenty of people who have problems, who uh, have personal issues with their health or with their, their home life, and that makes my characters, I hope, more real than the ones that uh, are essentially bulletproof. Well, it's interesting because, you know, that kind of goes back to the, <clears throat> the old idea even of Sherlock Holmes. I mean, people got really attached to Holmes and Watson as characters yes. and really turned to, because of the characters, even more than the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in some ways you could see Watson and, and Holmes as exactly, they are the same character. And Watson is the, is the human element that people will return to, and Holmes is the um, hard to believe, but irresistible force of detection. If it were just one or the other, you'd, you know, you'd fall asleep reading about Watson's life. And if it were just Holmes's life, you'd kind of, um, you'd wish he'd soften up a little bit. So I think finding, you know, Doyle, Conan, Arthur Conan Doyle certainly knew, I think, the human psyche of his readers and knew that they'd want a little bit of both. So now when you write your, <clears throat> your books, especially your crime books, do you, do you finish them and then you um, give them to somebody in law enforcement or whatnot for a kind of a sanity check? Or? <laughs> I don't think I could take the criticism. <laughs> so um, I try to get my research correct up front and right up front, but um, boy, am I, uh, you know, I, I respect law enforcement so much for the, the amazing breadth of things that they have to know on an average case. Uh, like I said before, I try to get small nuggets right. I, small, I try to get the, the gist of the thing right and make sure that I'm not saying anything particularly wrong. Um, but I'll, you know, a lot of my ideas and a lot of the, the twists will actually come from law enforcement agents. The funny thing is, uh, I can't always use, in fact, I can rarely use what my law enforcement buddies give me because it's too crazy. Um, they laugh and I laugh that I've got to take sometimes the most uh, pedestrian parts of the stories they tell me, and I can make a whole book out of that. If I related the things that, uh, that they, they find crazy, no one would believe it. <laughs> so we've got the, the superhero, and now what is the definition of hard-boiled? I mean, I always see that attached to your works. What, what does that mean exactly? Well, some people have called my stuff medium boiled. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, it's not soft boiled, right? Uh, but hard half baked. Half baked, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the metaphors keep rolling along. But um, yeah, hard boiled, I think, grew out of, uh, you know, we're talking Raymond Chandler and, uh, you know, the Philip Marlowe and, and other very long history and pedigree uh, of detective fiction that I think arose out of a 
uh, an American sense, especially of not wanting the, um, the sophisticated uh, British uh, genre right, that right, you know yeah. the, the tea, mm -hmm. tea in the afternoon and we'll solve the, the the murder in the in the parlor kind of thing. I think Chandler especially wanted to give people a sense of what life is really like on that the underbelly of society, and that's where the bad stuff happens. So that's the tr tradition I'm writing in. Um, I think we're used to it now, and we know it well. Uh, hopefully, I'm bringing something a little new to it. So. When they make your books into movies, who is going to play Marty Singer? <laughs> I've always had um, a hope that Ed Harris would continue to f essentially be frozen in time because I think he'd make a perfect, perfect uh, Marty Singer. But boy, by the time they, they start making my books into movies, I don't know how old <laughs> Ed is going to be, but maybe I can talk him back into, into doing something. Now, um, <clears throat> Marty Singer, who is he based on? Or is he just right out of your head? Or is it somebody you knew? That's a great question. I, um, I think the humor, and I've been told this by people who know me, the humor, Marty's humor and Marty's outlook, world outlook are mine, um, which is a good thing because that would be difficult to write somebody completely alien. Um, some of my law enforcement friends' personalities get in there, but um, thinking about it, I, Marty is also, there's a component of him, and I, I have a feeling other authors who write series characters would say this. There's a part of him, I don't know where it comes from. Uh, Marty takes over sometimes, he pops in, says his piece, and then he's, he's out of there. I'm like, I don't really know where that came from, but um, it's good and I'll take it. Yes, a lot of authors say that. You know, They'll start writing and then the character will take over. What, what does that mean or what does that feel like exactly? You're just sitting there and you start getting automatic writing or, or what is this? I wish it worked <laughs> like that all the time. Um, it's, uh, it's, for me, it often happens in dialogue. When I'm trying to write dialogue and not just exposition with Marty describing a room or anything. When he's talking to someone in my book, I've, maybe it's a, an extension of like method acting or something. When you inhabit the mind of first one person and then another and you're thinking, well, I, want, I need to make this accurate. I need to make this sound real. And it's got to go somewhere. I can't just have them talk about the weather <coughs> in circles. And to me, that's when it, it happens in dialogue. Marty will say something that I wouldn't have. Uh, personally, and uh, then it takes me in a direction, and usually I have to pursue it if I want to be true to what I'm trying to write. Now, <clears throat> you know, you say that um, some of your books are based on real life cases, mm. and then you fictionalize them, so how do you do that? I mean, you talk about one where you saw a, a billboard, and you got this brilliant idea, mm -hmm. so tell us about that. Um, once in a while an idea will, will catch you and uh, you don't really have any choice but to write about it. And uh, the uh, episode you're talking about was the basis for my third book, One Right Thing. My wife and I were driving by Lynchburg late at night on the highway. I think we were trying to head to parts far, very far south from that, so there was very little time to stop. But we passed a billboard and it said, uh, had a picture of a man and just one simple uh, headline, it said, uh, I don't remember the gentleman's name, but it said, so-and-so was killed on this day. Uh, do you know anything about it? And then a phone number and nothing else. And we, it was that, maybe it was because it was at night, maybe because we were on the road, maybe because we flashed right by it, and I thought, there's a book there. There's a story there. Um, I feel terrible that there's a real story there as well, a true story, but the fictional story, uh, I worked into Marty's life and history. and. Uh, it's a case where truth is almost stranger than fiction, uh, but it worked out for me. So how did you take that seed and turn it into a story? Um, I thought there was enough story there just on the billboard, but because who wouldn't say that was a mysterious hook, right? Yeah, a, a reason sure. to draw somebody in. Right. But the fact of the matter is it was a little too simple um, because if sometimes the best ideas that seem so juicy, something you could really sink your you're writing teeth into. You go there and you say, wow, that, that's not a novel, that's, that's a five minute episode. Uh, Marty calls a number, he walks over to the person with the, uh, with the problem and they tell him, here's what's going on. He said, no, I don't think I can help you and he gets back on the road. That, there's no story there. So I made it personal. Um, Marty knows the person on the billboard from a past event, uh -huh. 20 years past. Okay. And if you don't wrap it back up into your character, people are gonna say, eh, would he really have stopped? No, but he would have if he knew who, who that was. <clears throat> well, this kind of segues into another book you've written, uh, and that's a book for people who are just trying to become writers. Mm -hmm. it's, I think it's called How to Write a Novel or 
Telling your tale. Telling your tale, okay. Right. And that along with these others are, um, are available on Amazon, aren't they? That's right. Okay. Um, so, I've been kind of picking at this, if I am an aspiring author, kind of where do I start? I guess you kind of lay out some of the one, two, threes in, mm -hmm. in, um, in this book. Yeah, I tried to do something. Uh, there's cert the, the market is certainly lousy with how-to guides about how to write. And when I say lousy, of course, that's I'm being uh, sarcastic because there are some great, great books out there. But what I found when I started writing, there were some really simple questions that I couldn't get answered, uh, at least not easily. How long is a book? How lo often do you write? How long do you write? Uh, what's a good daily quota? Those are things that you'll find eventually if you keep digging, but uh, I didn't know that a 300-page book was 75,000 words. And when I knew that, I said to myself, well, what the heck is 75,000 words? Uh, the most I've, I've never counted my words, really, unless it was for a term paper, and that was usually in pages. So I tried to, uh, try to put some of those items into essentially a very short um, how-to guide for people who are just wanting to get started. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. What's the hardest thing that a, a new writer has to deal with? Uh, I think learning the work ethic. That uh, there's a, a funny little saying that most writers know after a while, and it's the, the BIC method, which is butt in chair. Um, you've got to sit in a chair and write. Uh, writing doesn't show up one day in the mail. Uh, you make that happen. And that was a tough lesson for myself. I thought I would get a smoking jacket and a a pipe and Stephen King would show up and hand me my contract and in the contract would be a box and in the box would be the manuscript that was somehow attributed to me. But the fact of the matter is writing is hard and you have to do a lot of it to get good and you have to do a lot of it to stay there. Um, when somebody says they've written 30 novels or something similar, you know they've been working hard and I think that's one of the first things that I certainly had to learn. So how much time do you put in a day writing? When I'm really on a roll, or I know I have a deadline, uh, I'll work probably over six, seven hours, uh, just fingers on the keyboard, as they say. Mm -hmm. uh, as a self-published writer, uh, an independent writer, I have a lot of promotional and marketing uh, requirements too, responsibilities, if I don't just wanna kind of disappear into the background. So right. I probably market, promote, and reach out to fans and readers three or four hours a day and write three or four hours a day on a typical writing day. Mm -hmm. Um, now, we're living in interesting times because of the ebook revolution, mm -hmm. and you've certainly been a, an advocate and are considered by many kind of an expert on this. So, why the ebook route? A, a digital book, ebook, electronic book, uh, is a new format for publishing. And uh, most people are, are familiar with Amazon, uh, but also Barnes and Noble, Kobo. Uh, Smashwords, these are all distributors of, of books that uh, in the past would only be available as a, as a print version or paperback or hardback version. But digital books allow independent writers such as myself to get their, their works out for a very low cost and for essentially an immediate uh, feedback. So when I, when I hear somebody says, boy, I'd really like to try your book, but I haven't, uh, you know, I don't have $15 or $20 to drop on the paperback, and I'll say, well, hey, the the digital version can be in your hands in a few minutes if you have a smartphone or a tablet, a computer, or an e-reader like a Kindle or a Nook. So it's, um, it's really revolutionized the publishing industry and certainly revolutionized the industry for authors. And I think one of the things you, you mentioned here is the price differential. I mean, there's a, a quantum difference between um, a digital book and a paper book. Absolutely. Um, and I guess now it's the author who's getting the lion's share as opposed to the, the middleman. That's right. Uh, traditional publishers, which is how publishing was done for uh, 90 years or so up until probably just six or seven years ago, uh, they have a lot of overhead. They have people to pay. They have warehousing. They have printing costs. Uh, and uh, they took the lion's share of the money. Uh, I don't know percentages exact or, or, or amounts, but I know the authors that I've spoken with who've worked with traditional publishers saw just a fraction of the, the amount that a reader would pay for a paper book. But a digital version uh, often, for instance, I walk away with 70% of the cover price of 399. So 
that's great. <laughs> right. I'll take that all day long. All right. Some people, <clears throat> um, for example, there's another thriller writer, um, Joe Conrath. Mm -hmm. He's done extraordinarily well. well. Yes, he's a great example of somebody who was traditionally published. I think he had uh, his, um, oh, what's the name of his, he's got a, a female protagonist. Oh, right. Um, Jack, and, uh, Jack Daniels. Jack Daniels, Jackie Daniels, right. that's right. Um, I think he published something like seven her, in her series uh, and then was very disgruntled with the, the reception he was getting from his publisher. and. Uh, so when the ebook revolution came along in about 2009, 2010, Joe Conrath jumped on, in with both feet and he is one of the, I'd say, probably top 20 sellers in the country because yeah. of it. And when we're talking top 20 sellers, I mean, it's over a million dollars as I understand that he's making a year. Yeah, yeah. Which is just quite remarkable because as I understand before that he was what a mid-list Midlist author. Yes, um, which is why he was he was both getting disgruntled with his situation and his publisher was disgruntled with him. Uh, they're looking for the next Michael Connolly or the next Patricia Cornwell. They want their authors to hit it out of the park, and that's not always possible. Right. So, uh, how do you, um, the next question somebody will have is, okay, now I'm going to go and do this ebook. Mm -hmm. Well, then the rubber meets the road. How do I promote my ebook? <laughs> Promoting, yeah. Well, uh, I know I personally have found it very helpful to write a series. Uh, it's what I wanted to do anyway, so the synergy was there, and that's nice. But uh, you'll get a, a readership, a dedicated readership, and which is the best promotion, not just random people buying your book, but people who are expecting that next book and love your characters. You only get that if you're writing a series. Uh, a lot of people have many one-off or standalone ideas floating around in their head. And that's great, you should write what you know and write what you want. But if you want to make it, uh, at least at first, a series character is the way to go. Because people want to know more about this person and they'll come back for more. Mm -hmm. uh, but my day-to-day -day promotion is, um, as you might guess, it's social media, it's blogging, it's doing signings and TV appearances and interviews. Uh, you've got to get your name out there. Exposure is the name of the game. And eventually the hope is that with that exposure comes a dedicated readership, and then you can kind of change your focus or turn your focus to more writing, which can only help. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> what advice would you give uh, somebody who is just getting started in, in e-books? I'd say it depends on where they are in their writing career. Uh, if they are, uh, if they've been writing for quite a while, if they're an experienced writer, if they, if they have a comfort level with the quality of their writing, uh, then they need to get every available backlist title up onto uh, whatever their, you know, pick your poison, but Amazon at, at this point is the, is the best distributor at this point. If they're not quite sure where their writing stands, uh, self-publishing is not a ticket. It's not, it's not carte blanche to put anything you want on the web and hope that it sells. It's, it's another format for being a responsible writer. And so you need to know that you are writing well and they, they're, you're, the quality of your writing is up to snuff. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> as in professional or traditional publishing, there are a lot of people who kind of glom on to new writers and sell them all kinds of services and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's kind of a, of a pitfall Yes. when you get into this. I mean, is there any way to, to negotiate through that or any guidance you would give to people on, you know, how to be wary of Absolutely. overspending? Yes, yes. I think there's a, uh, uh, because the ebook revolution is at, at its core, at its, the definition of it is that it's, um, it's based on technology, which intimidates people. And there are some technical hurdles to getting your work up on the web or up on Amazon for sale. And for people who are not technologically proficient or savvy, they think that that's a insurmountable barrier. And what they're willing to do is take some really hard earned money or savings, which is even uh, sadder when it, this happens, and they'll just give it to somebody to get their work uh, past that technological hurdle. And they think they've kind of done the right thing. Little do they know that you know the services that many that are offered by many people are essentially scams. They're asking for thousands of dollars, even hundreds of dollars, for things that either you can do for free or for much cheaper. Uh, and I don't want to badmouth anybody in particular, but uh, many of the, the traditional publishers, knowing that there's a market out there for people who would, who would love to have their books published, uh, 
have their own divisions that seek out these, these would-be authors and um, essentially gut them for their money. So um, I, would, I would advise anybody, know exactly what you're getting into and what you're getting for your money. Well, that's good advice, and um, I guess I'd like to direct you folks to Matt's website, uh, where he has a lot more advice on how to avoid pitfalls and uh, how to prosper in your writing career. This show has been brought to you by a generous gift from the Margarita W. and Donald J. Metzger Endowment. Uh, please visit us at www.timetravel21.com and write to us at timetravel21 at yahoo.com. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.